tengah kasur Buhata kikita unggulalia Dengar sisina kakasya unggul Tiawa asu Buhata biasa unggul ini Panu ani Mana tanah kini Kana kujipi Tagala kakupakungu I padungu Tengah kasu Buhata punya a ini Musai pemabatanga Oh Paku jipi And that is A world creation myth In Katiao language Hello I'm Budkala And this is my Konlang Showcase for Katiao. Katiao is one of my main Konlangs. I have been making Konlangs since 2012 when I was on junior high school, I think. And just like every first Konlang, it sucks. And because it was sucks, I did not make any new conlang again until for kinda four years. I was starting to make another conlang again after I made a world building project called Tagalabuni, which previously named Sandikala on 2016. On the same year, I made my second conlang named Pakum that I'm still working on until this day. The Katiao language itself was started to be made on 2019 when I decided to make a mother language for Paku. But it is not until October 2020, so I decided to mark the Conlang as finished. And even though I believe there are still many revisions to come. In fact, I have been adding many corrections when I am working on the showcase. As I previously mentioned, Katia U is a part of the world building project of Takalbuni. It is world building I made for my own Qatar system. Until the showcase is made, Takalbuni has had many aspects in its part, like world map, regional map, climate map, and well, basically all the maps. There's also a special system with the migration and split history culture, political system, magic, and, well, you guess it, languages. Katia U is one of the language in Tagalbuni, and because of its history, Katia U is not a regular language, even in its own world. The language of Katia U was spoken 11,000 years before prison by the Katia Gaya people. They are the ancestor of the third of the world population. The Katyagaya people live in the Pamerah land, a big place in the equator. And the climate there is quite great but not that great for them since the land was also the home for many predators. Yet they survive and built many big ancient cities that influenced the world thousand years after their extinction. Because of their land that full of jungle, forest, and some savanna, they built a religion based on worshipping a tree. With their holy tree is called Pakung, and its so-called husband tree, Padung. Since Katiau was used by the ancestor of the third population of the world, its descendant languages were also spread so wide to the whole planet. In fact, Five major languages in the world today was all descendants of Katiao language. Uh, there is something interesting about this conlang I made because I did a reverse evolution to make Katiao. You see, the first conlang I made for this project is Pakum, which is a proto austronesian based conlang. After thinking I need a sibling language of Pakum, which is ancient Bragri. 
I started to make a modeling witch for Pakung, the Kateau language. The thing is, I want ancient braggery to be, somehow, based on proto-Semitic style, like Trikonsonantal, non-concrete narrative system, and so on. So I must make Kateau to fit both of them, both proto-Austronesian and proto-Semitic. That's a big challenge for me because both of them are very different. Okay, with all of those, let's get started. Oh, and keep in mind that there's maybe some errors on the showcase, be it a name, a linguistic term, or anything. So, yeah, let's start. This is the Katiao language. The Katiagaya people actually call their language as Pakaki or the instrument of speaking. The name Katiao itself was actually means for the people. Since their life is very influenced by tree, many nouns and symbols in their script came from plant-based thing. Katiao language is a more stable and simpler version of the proto-language, the proto-Katiao language. Proto-Katiao language was to put in the words so complicated with many rules and sounds that even the language was varies between a short place and time. And for information, I actually intended to make the proto language to be so messy for explaining the Katyagaya successfulness on taking the land of Pamera. Katyag has 30 consonants and 4 vowel with no line distinction and no diphthong. 30 consonants are quite a lot actually, but it is quite a small inventory if compared to the proto Katiao language, which had a staggeringly 109 consonants. It has so many sounds starting from quite common sounds like pa, ba, and ma, until a set of three click sounds. But fortunately, the madness comes to an end after the number of sound was reduced into a good amount of 30 consonants. The Katia consonants are pa, pa, ta, tia, ta, ka, ka, a, ba, pa, da, dia, ta, ka, ka, sa, sia, ha, za, zia, ma, na, nia, na, ra, ria, la, dia, wa. Yeah, and the Katiao vowels are I, U, E, A. The schwa has an allophonic sound when it is near a glottal stop. It will change from E to U. Each plosives has their own plain and separated version, plus a palatalized version for the whole alveolar sounds. I and yes, I place the Y sound there so the table won't be ugly. The palatalized alveolar was actually a palatal sound of proto -Katiao. So the CHE become TIA and J become DIA and so on. The Katiao syllables are open syllables, a CV structure with a C being any consonants and V being any vowels. The default stress is on the penultimate which means the stress will fall on the second to last syllable of a word. Except when there is a glottal stop. If a word contains a glottal stop, then the stress will fall on the last glottal stop. So it will be Tesuhi instead of Isuhi and Panua instead of Panua. However, the simplicity of CV syllable didn't exist in the proto language. The proto Katiu has a FCVFM syllable with F being any fricative and nasal. The CV structure of Katiao was a result of uh, epenthesis, I think, and deletion. Sometimes a vowel can appear inside, between, and at the end of the syllable. The vowel is usually just a result of copying the nearest vowel, a coloring of the nearest consonant, or a vowel pattern alteration that we will get in into it later. Many words are derived directly from a verbal root by adding a prefix into it. The verb maka to shelter, when added a prefix ku 
means main, primary, and great into it, will produce the word kumaka, that means house. A root always be in a form of disyllabic, while the prefix always be in a form of monosyllabic. This method of deriving word is so productive that the older words are out of use and replaced by the newer derived words. Oh, and there's also this. The majority of the verbal roots came from the noun in proto cartesian language. There are still many roots that came from the proto cartesian verb, but many of them had also been replaced. The method seems quite good. Unfortunately, many prefixes has multiple meanings because of the merging process of the word in proto cartesian For example, the prefix ke has two functions, to form a resultative adjective, and to form a basic quality adjective. It is because the prefix was the result of merging of two different words in proto -Kateo. K and K. The sound change had made both of them become the same prefix. Even though this method isn't perfect, but the Katya Kaya people seems to be okay with it. Before we go any further, I want to show you the Katya U pronouns, because it will come up quite often. Oh, by the way, if you know anything about Austronesian languages, you will know some of these pronouns, since many of it came straight from the proto austronesian pronouns, with the addition of dual number. Katya U is a VSO language, different from its proto-language, who is an SVO language. The adjective came after the noun and the possessor come also after possessi. It is used a preposition. So, the sentence Tepaka akuhi e pukunu kaya anasu means I smack your big tree has a literal meaning of smack I three big of you. Nouns in Katya falls on three causes animate, inanimate, and abstract. The animate nouns include pronouns, people, animal, plus pakungu tree and hiyangi, or god. The inanimate includes foods, and yes, that animal also fall onto this class. Natural phenomena, landscape, to weather, and some more non-abstract things. And the abstract nouns are, well, fall into the abstract places. The number distinction also differ between classes, with the animate having the biggest number distinction of singular, dual, and plural. Remember in the phonotactic system we talked about vowel pattern alternation? We will cover it now. The three vowels in Katiao has some kind of inherent characteristic with them, according to uh, Katiagaya people. The A vowel has a familiar character, while the U being the mysterious character. This characteristic determines if the noun were being familiar or not when adding a vowel to the old proto words. The phenomenon can be seen on the word like sikana, fish, or literally something to be eaten. When the added vowel was changed to U, it become Sikanu, literally strange fish, who means puffer fish. It is not really productive though, it can only be seen on several inanimate nouns, but this pattern appears on some major determiners and articles, so yeah. The vowel pattern also appears on the noun case system. The nominative for pronouns was different from other common nouns. The nominative pronoun case came from the fossilized proto nominative case. Like we have already talked before, the more abstract the noun, the lesser its number distinction. The dual case marker ala came from hula, two, and the plural came from ara, group. The genitive case always used the enclitic form of the pronouns. There is something I need to talk about, the uh, intransitive verb. According to the previous system, the Katyu sentence for I sleep should be Tajuru Akuhi, but it's incorrect. 
because sleep is an inherently intransitive verb. The correct way to say is yuruku, with the enclitic form of pronouns become a suffix. When an intransitive verb has a subject of pronouns, then the pronouns will attach as a suffix. Also, if the verb is uh, inherently intransitive, then it will use its basic root, while the inherently transitive verb will use the ta prefix. Whew, we have just talked about the verb, so the next thing that we will cover is the grammar. Finally, Katya U doesn't have tenses in the true sense, but it has aspects and moods. There are four moods, indicative, imperative, optative, and interrogative. Indicative is used when we try to tell a factual event. In other hand, optative mood is used when we want to say something like might happen. Imperative and interrogative are just giving command and asking questions. The indicative mood has three aspects. Imperfective for a general event, progressive for repeated action or an event that is still progressing, and perfect for an action that has been finished. There are also three frequency changing or voice system. Passive when we only focus on the patient, reflexive when the verb is also applied to the agent itself, and causative that uh, have the meaning of make something to X. <laughs> to be honest, I cannot describe it good enough, so I will just give you an example. I use the verb kana to eat here. Oh, and every system has their own history, if you're interested. The progressive aspect in KTU was a result from the reanalysis of plural construction in proto KTU nouns. In this example, kung had a plural form of kung kung. After a sound change, it become kuak kuang, and later become kukung, with the meaning of to bend repeatedly. The sound change also applied to the singular form, and from this, the katyakaya saw the duplication had some kind of progressive quality on it. So, well, there we have it progressive aspect. The perfect aspect had a different approach. It came from the word tunwa, chefly, which a word that people said when they had just finished a work or an action. After the word order change, the word tunwa, who had gone through a sound change, become sandwiched between the verb and the subject. The construction was done so frequently that the Katyakaya people finally used it as a perfect marker. For the passive, it was the result of the word pain, means because. Uh, it was first used to make an adjective phrase until the presence of the word become a marker that changed the focus from the agent into the patient. And then the word was finally reanalysis as a passive marker. The reflexive was quite unique since it came from the plural form of kolm, means for. So the sentence, I wash myself, become it is me and for me who wash. It's quite weird to think in that way, but the protocatio actually had many forms like this, like the word kolm, stop, that changed the sentence, I wash, into I will never wash again. So back to reflexive. Just like the formation of perfect, the word kukum becomes sandwich in between the verb and the subject. And different from another system, the causative case has a more straightforward evolution. The marker came from the word mpwa, which to make. That immediately become a causative marker, even in the proto-language. Uh, there is an interesting case for the optative food. It came from the same reason why Sikanu means strange fish. The optative mood was actually a strange version of imperative moods. So the optative mood was actually means something like go, do something strangely, which later become a kind of hope 
an act of hoping something to do it. And here it is, the complete chart of the verb system evolution. Before we leave the grammar, let's talk about two things related to transitivity. We have seen that intransitive and transitive verb with one object. So why not seeing a transitive verb with two objects? Also, let's see a detransitive sentence. The transitive verb sentence formation can use two verbs. When the agent is placed at the end of the word, it took a locative case, just kinda look like English and also in the Russian. And finally, we are here, script. My most favorite steps every time I made a conlang. Writing system that functioned as information keeping system is quite a new thing for the Katyagaya people. But the art of etching, carving, and chiseling had been established long ago. Katyagaya people named their writing system as Pabatika, the instrument of design, and considered it a religious practice. It is logographic-ish system with some new experimental form. The people always use Uliyinu tree as a medium for writing because that is the only tree beside Pakumu that will not take natural damage. Oh, and the symbol can only be chiseled by using a tool called Zitagha. It is a stone with a mix of magic called the mana, or mean the mind. It is not every person can write or read, though. Even there are only several highborn who can read and write. It is all because the writing activity was considered pure and so religious, and also the system of writing itself is, well, quite complicated. As a logographic script, each clip represents a full word, but the shape of clips are sometimes not really match with the real appearance of the thing it represented. For example, the clip for cat, bird, and chicken are just a modified version of the animal glyph. And as you can see, even though chicken in the Katyakaya world doesn't have four legs, but the glyph just doesn't care and give it four legs. Another example is the glyph for jellyfish, which doesn't represent a jellyfish at all. The glyph also represents the verb. And just like the nouns, many of them are just a modified form of an already existing glyph. Sometimes two or more verbs that have similarity will also have an almost identical glyph. This is good enough, but there are always come many new words that cannot always be represented by these glyphs. So the religious group of Katyagaya make a new invention. Because the Katya syllables are all open, they start to realize that they can use their glyphs to represent only the first syllable. For example, this glyph's real sound was Pazia'i, that later became the syllable of Pa. Even though this is a great idea, but many reject this idea because religious reasons that they think reducing the value of the glyph is an act of corruption. But guess what? This system has flourishing anyway. Even the hypeborn start to learn it, even though they only use the plain glyph for it. And the result is this incomplete chart of syllabary system. Because the chart was incomplete, there is many ambiguity when using the system. Like this glyph, this glyph can be used to represent she, shu, and she, and only context can determine it. Because of that, this glyphs can be read as shilanga, the sparkling one, shilanga, sparkle, shilanga, the sparkled thing, and also shilanga cave or tubular way. Sometimes people can still be confused when trying to read this, yet people seem to like it anyway. At least now they don't need many new clips for every new words. So they just kept all the ambiguity there. Until some religious scholar realized that the column for k sound has a complete series on its chart. So they think, what if we use the vowel on this series to indicate the vowel of another symbols? And they were experimenting with it. 
they have sheet glyph and then they added cook glyph on the right side of it to indicate the vowel so they made shoe sound how about if they place she and k side by side yes they produce a sh sound so there they have it a vowel indicator for their writing system now we can have this shilanga and also shulanga and shilanga it is a major improvement in their writing system this invention will also generate the future writing system in their descendant languages Pakum is one of them after this invention many people start to learn to write and read and many things happens because of it both bad and good but they keep moving forward until 10,500 years ago they basically cannot be stopped they met with the golden age of the wood brought the society to the power they have never imagined many city-states was founded trade routes were made connected all the major city-states in Palmyra then the city of Daria was built as the unity symbol of major three cities they expanded their territory and defeated their enemies took the Silk Road and rule the great mountain of Putyuka. The power was so great, and all the Katyagaya people was united under the same ruler, the first emperor of the three. With it, the first empire of Paku was established. They expand through the equator until all the known world was under their rule. They cannot be stopped until the great catastrophe of Kilabu happened. It was so devastating that the continent was pierced through, leaving a gaping hole at the center of it. The first empire was gone, but the people was. But they were no longer a Katyagaya. Not anymore. But be glad, because their descendants will once again rule the known world with many new languages. And that is Katyang language. I hope you can enjoy this showcase and I hope this video can give a good insight for you. If there's anything you want to say to me, will it be comments or critic, please let me know. So to end this, Aku tuo kashika analiana.